Hey, hi, folks. Um, so my name is Anurag, and I'll be kind of talking about policy as code and how we kind of used it to strengthen our governance security within a cloud. Uh, so basically, the agenda for this particular session uh, would be to have like just an go through an overview of the current set of challenges that we have within uh, cloud security tooling, be it open source, uh, commercials, and things like that. Uh, and then we'll kind of talk about how policy can, as code can help. You can also, policy as code is also generally referred as compliance as code as well. While these are sort of similar, policy as code is generally the umbrella term in my opinion, right? Uh, then we kind of dive into how did I set up or we set up our program at, and then how did we go about implementing this and then the takeaways from our implementation of policy as code program. So this is a very, a cartoon that I really like and that kind of depicts every cloud architecture uh, to a some extent. Um, so yeah, uh, you have some databases, you have some ad hoc engineering that's done and things like that. While this is sort of the reality of pretty much all cloud architectures, be it like in any cloud provider, uh, this, the setup to kind of secure these kind of look like these, right? You're using some sort of validation within your CICD pipelines to, you know, have validations, be it like CFN NAG or like, you know, have checks within the pipeline, either if you're deploying via Terraform, CloudFormation or any ARM or any other tool, like, right? Uh, so that's one. Then you also have like some sort of posture management tool that runs point in time scans for within your cloud infrastructure or to, you know, get that telemetry in within your platform about like from your network to your uh, vulnerabilities and a lot of those things, right? And third, to kind of tie all of them up, you would have some sort of in-house automations, right? Um, to kind of tie those loose ends or have those custom edge case scenarios that, that you want to cover, right? So there is going to be some form of automation there within your infrastructure. Before we kind of move on, I kind of wanted to help you understand what the scale of the infrastructure that we were working with, right? And then we'll kind of dive a little deeper into the challenges, the problems that we kind of came up prop and the probable solutions, right? Uh, so this sort of looked what our cloud organization structure looked like. We had more than 1500 plus AWS accounts. Those were divided into, into like a bunch of different OUs, central services like CICD, DNS, network, security accounts like log archive, tooling, uh, incident response, forensics, and those sort of had a different OU. Some of our product organizations, right? Staging, production, dev environments, and, and a lot of those things were in a segregated OU, right? And every or you had more like a few hundred accounts, like the production had nearly a thousand accounts and formed a bulk of our mistake. Uh, while AWS was sort of our major footprint within the organization uh, in our cloud infrastructure, we did have a sizable GCP footholding as well. Uh, we either for Google APIs, data analytics, uh, machine learning, AIML services, some of our products ran in Google Cloud um, and things like that. So that was a piece of it, right? Uh, this kind of gives you some level of visibility in terms of, hey, what the infrastructure and the span of that particular infrastructure look like. But to manage the security, there were certain challenges that uh, sort of came up one of them was all the rules that applied or the 
security controls that we wanted to apply for let's say production did not apply to stage or central services right every set of accounts or OUs had a different uh, set of requirements and things like that right so one of the things that challenges that we had was customizability of the rule set right because every environment was a tad bit different it we needed to customize based on the environment that we were running these rules against uh, a lot of tools at the moment while they give you a metadata and some bit of context not a and uh, maybe would show you like a nice graph like a graphql graph or like a neo4j or something of that sort it not a lot of them are aware on what the surrounding metadata and the context to that particular piece of infrastructure or resources the third because we were always running in a reactive mode once we kind of found that you know there is an issue that is present of hey we kind of need to fix it we need to work with the stakeholders be it engineering be it ops be it anybody else within the organization uh, there is a lot of communication to and fro and things like that to be able to uh, you know get that issue or misconfiguration or vulnerability fixed within because the infrastructure span is always increasing it is always an operational overhead to kind of automate or you know get something fixed the, and as the infrastructure you always have a high, high backlog of issues that uh, you are ever working with hey, to kind of remediate or alleviate in some form of the other uh, as i kind of mentioned earlier we are always reactive rather than being proactive uh, there is a bit of proactiveness in terms of hey you can kind of block your cicd pipelines and things like that right uh, some of the things that we sort of had uh, around our cloud infrastructure is we did give uh, developers accounts standalone accounts that they could do POS with uh, and you know just spin up any infrastructure uh, and things like that within uh, the environment right um, which were segregated environments but that is something that we allowed them to do and there was uh, a segregated OU for that uh, to kind of talk about what the probable solutions were uh, we thought hey let's sort of build like an in-house custom solution that would sit on top of our uh, pipelines or our cspm to be able to understand hey and enrich that particular alert or issue for with some metadata or with some context to for or even automate uh, remediation automation to be able to you know kind of do this in-house and use operational overhead uh, and things like that but to build something uh, this large and being able it would require a lot of operational and engineering over it to kind of maintain and operate that right the second thing is uh, we kind of integrate a bunch of tools together right uh, cspm source uh, and things like that again uh, pipelines there is a lot of time and effort that is spent in integrating them together and managing and making sure they work that we intend them to and things like that uh having a middleware when i say middleware it basically means having some form of like an orchestration layer that kind of connects between the two right now uh, let's say your cspm sends out an alert to for example like Jira as your ticketing tool, right? Uh, you have a middleware that sort of takes that data, enriches it, and then send it to Jira with all the metadata, the context that's needed for that particular resource and the prioritization based on a predefined set of rules that you have sort of defined, right? So that is one. Another one that we probably came up with is using policy as code, right? Uh, now, we kind of have probable solutions right but before picking out a solution uh we kind of wanted to highlight hey these are 
the set of non-negotiable requirements that we wanted to have. Uh, so some of them are basically ability to support multiple cloud providers. As you saw earlier, uh, we were in AWS, we were in GCP, and we didn't have a, a very small workload in Azure as well. So ability to support multiple cloud pro providers was something that was uh, pretty significant and was not really a negotiable item for us, right? Uh, being user friendly, uh, it's not it. It what we meant mean by this is basically not just security but other stakeholders, right? Ops, uh, compliance, uh, anybody else who is a stakeholder to us should be able to use uh, this particular tool, right? Uh, can some scale to our requirements, right? Uh, we, as we kind of saw earlier, 1500 plus accounts, approximately 150 GCP projects uh, that we wanted to scale this to. Uh, something that we can really manu uh, manipulate, build on top of, or customize based on our requirements was one of the things that we kind of wanted to do. Uh, and while we were looking out, we didn't want to change, really change a lot of tooling that we exist had. So we kind of wanted to like have something that was easily pluggable into our current tooling and CICD systems, right? Uh, something that because we had developer systems, we had, uh, you know, throwable accounts that developers were using for POCs and things like that. Not a lot all of those accounts did have like a CI-CD systems. So CI-CD systems were not the only touch point that we had. We had people going into consoles, creating infrastructure and things like that, right? Uh, so these were the set of requirements. Uh, based on these requirements, policy as code looked like a very probable answer to all our solution, all our problems. Uh, when I say policy as code, what exactly do I mean? Right. Uh, it basically automates the decision making, uh, defined in like a YAML JSON or whatever, to like a high language tool. Right. A high language DSL language is what we use to kind of define the policy uh, and automate that. Uh, can be the policy doesn't have to be security. It can be pretty much anything. Right. From operational best practices to compliance checks to misconfigurations and things like that. Now we kind of saw the requirements. We see policy as code, but then why did we select policy as code? Right. Uh, the first thing that we saw was automated and real-time enforcement. Right. Uh, as 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 soon as the infrastructure is spun up, uh, we had some level of enforcement, and we didn't really have to wait for a CSPM to scan our infrastructure and then give a give out. Uh, hey, these are the issues. These are the things that you want to look at. Right. Uh, we had one place for all of our policy management. Right. We didn't have like, hey, your CACD checks are stored in a different tool. Your uh, CSPM have a different sort of tooling, and you kind of have to keep them in sync at all the times. Uh, it was scalable. Right. We could scale this to however infrastructure, however level that we wanted. So that was one. Uh, then single point of truth. All of our policies are in one single place. The that and everybody from engineering, from uh, ops, anybody can kind of take a look at it and things like that. Uh, visibility and collaboration. Since it's all stored in one single place, it's open to everybody that they can look at, they can submit suggestions and things like that. So that was one, and it allowed us as well to kind of, you know, evangelize this internally. Hey, this is what the restrictions for this particular OU, these particular set of accounts are. Uh, and it provided a level of education and awareness within the organization itself to be able to, uh, you know, see here what the policies are that needs to be enforced or kind of considered when we are doing something. Versioning and rollback, it was e easy to sort of track this. Uh, all of this was all of the policies were in uh, like a version control system uh, similar to GitHub. So we were very easily able to kind of see here what the changes are being made, uh, who's making those changes. And like it had an inherent audit trail uh, that we had. 
uh, standardization consistency since everything was defined as YAML files. Uh, it was pretty easy to kind of standardize and have uh, validation checks and linting within the uh, pipelines uh, and whenever the code was being or the policies were being committed. So it became a fairly large uh, um, synonymous uh, thing for us, right? Uh, now we have been talking about a lot of the benefits, right? But what about the stakeholders? Who our stakeholders are? Uh, of course, security being one. Uh, FinOps was another uh, stakeholder for us. While uh, they did not have a lot of policies in terms of, but a lot of policies that they did around like tag management uh, and like right sizing of our infrastructure under utilization and reporting those on um, was really helpful for the FinOps organization within the org to kind of have that visibility and things like that. Uh, how did we do it? We'll kind of talk about that in the later slides. Uh, then compliance was one uh, where we kind of talked about, hey, what are the AMI restrictions uh, and life cycles and the networking requirements, encryption requirements and things like that. They were able to enforce that. Uh, by writing a YAML file, right? Security, uh, this is obviously one, this was a, sort of spearheaded uh, as a security project that uh, was open to like a wide set of stakeholders, right? It could be use cases were as simple as, as enforcement of MBSV2, like security group remediations, um, folks opening up things to internet was another use case, responding to guard duty alerts and things like that. You know, cloud ops became another one, like having life cycles defined within a YAML file, right? It could be infrastructure, access keys, a bunch of other things. Uh, when we were sort of taking a look at uh, policy as code, there were a bunch of tools that we looked at, right? Uh, OPA. Uh, I think pretty much everybody is sort of familiar with OPA. Uh, it basically uses Rego and uh, to kind of define the policy. Similarly, HashiCorp Sentinel, Packbot, Cloud Custodian, uh, cloud formation guard and regular right all of these are policy as code tools which kind of have a lot that we potentially evaluated and things like that right uh, now coming to what, what the right pack tool for us would look like right uh, if you look at the policy as code tools uh, one of the major things that we had to choose is either have an authorization layer between the event occurs or after that event occurs, right? Uh, because uh, from the list of tools that were showed sort of earlier, OPA and things like that plug into your uh, pipe, CICD pipelines and have that authorization check of whether it's allowed or not. And then kind of, you can sort of fail the pipeline. But uh, for example, things like Cloud Custodian and things like that, uh, you don't, have that. They work once the event has happened within your cloud infrastructure, and then they kind of perform uh, all the uh, policy enforcement and things like that. Being able to run periodic checks, right? That was one thing that we wanted to do, having an audit, a, like a point in time check of all the resources and infrastructure that was present within our organization and things like that. Uh, low operational and engineering overhead. We didn't really want to spend a lot of time building something uh, that we had to spend a lot of effort on. Uh, and easy to understand and use by stakeholders was something that we really wanted, right? Uh, so taking a look at this and with the tools as that we were evaluating, Cloud Custodian uh, seemed like a really good choice. Cloud Custodian is basically an open source rule engine for resource management and account management within a bunch of cloud providers, as well as Kubernetes and uh, Terraforms and things like that. Uh, you basically write YAML DSLs to kind of take actions on selective resources by filtering them and querying them. Uh, some of the pros were uh, basically, you didn't have to write a lot of custom. There were inbuilt automated responses based on what you wanted to do. YAML, it's pretty easy to understand. It's declarative. Uh, there's nothing can go wrong. Uh, since it's open source, we could extend it uh, to whatever we wanted, uh, change, make changes and things like that. Uh, it had inbuilt and alerting. Uh, 
by the tour itself so we didn't really have to you know make a bunch of connected to like slack or teams and things like that near real time and scheduled jobs um, as i kind of mentioned earlier we wanted to uh, point in time reports for certain uh, policies and things like that cons uh, because cloud custodian like is invoked once it sees a cloud trail event uh, all your processing happens after that infrastructure has been provisioned or that action has been taken and that can introduce some friction or some delay within the enforcement of the policy uh if you're deploying something from let's say iac and things like that it can sometimes mess up with your state files big depending on how your policy looks like now uh, reporting and dashboarding is not inherently built into it uh, you kind of have to build something custom uh, send your matrices uh, to like a third party solution and then build your reporting on top of that uh, had support for like multiple cloud providers and not just cloud providers like kubernetes set of arms and things like that uh, so this is what a typical cloud custodian architecture looks like uh, you define the policies within yaml and then it basically checks those files and deploys a lambda and a cloudwatch trigger on what it needs to perform the lambda would be deployed based on the yaml file depending on the actions that needs to be performed uh, so to kind of get a more much better understanding of cloud custodian we'll sort of go into a demo uh, so this is like me running cloud custodian locally on a particular system so this is the policy that says hey enforce mds v2 on all systems irrespective of where they are and things like that uh, so basically requires tokens are required hop limit is to and metadata is allowed to fetch tax so we take a look at we run this command using this as a dry run we see that there are about 13 resources that it filtered on and this is there are 13 resources that we need to change on so these are the resources that we have we sort of take a look if this is optional at the moment we kind of run custodian and enforce the mdsv2 now if you sort of check uh, on what the output for that particular instance would look like we have as we saw in the policy earlier the HTTP tokens, which is basically MDSV2, is enabled, and we have put a hop limit of three. This is what the policy would look, look like. So basically, like from about 10, 12 lines of code, you kind of in, had enforcement of MDSV2. Uh, I we know you can do that via SAP as well. Uh, but rather than restricting, we kind of wanted to take this approach uh, as an intermediate step before we kind of had a hard limit of YSAP that you'll not be able to spin up infrastructure. Another example, which is fairly simple, is rotation of your access keys within your AWS, right? You see the policy name here, description, resources, hey, how, and the filters, right? Do not run this on all of my access keys, but only on access keys which are active and then have the age as greater than 90, right? Uh, now you can have multiple actions depend on those conditions, right? Uh, so the action is the remove keys. If the age is 90 days, just disable them. If the age is like 110 days or 80 days, sorry, uh, just remove the keys altogether from the infrastructure. And that is something that you will be able to do. Uh, this is another life cycle example for life cycle uh, of an attached EBS volumes. Uh, this is something that we had uh, written up it's fairly easy to read and um, things like that. Basically uses tag to identify uh, of which EBS volumes are 30 days and older and send a notification and things like that. Now, once since 
we you see these examples right uh, uh there were a bunch of issues on why we kind of had to write a custom wrapper around this basically the lack of ability to integrate third party tools was one right we had a bunch of other toolings be it your edias be it your uh anything any other tooling uh we, we cloud custodian simply did not have that ability uh API or webhook support, uh, while you could send out webhooks as uh, an output or or an action, uh, you basically couldn't invoke Cloud Custodian from like an API and things like that. Uh, the second, the third one is basically cost. So you, because you're running Lambdas at such a scale, uh, while Lambdas tend to be cheaper, but when you are looking like a, ten, a bird eye view on uh, such a large infrastructure, uh, the cost becomes thick. So we kind of had to rewrite that and uh, AWS service limits. For certain large infrastructures, we were sort of hemmed, hitting the limits for uh, within AWS around Lambda invocations and things like that. So that really helped us. Hey, this is something that's not really scaling uh, to where we wanted either based on the number of evaluations that we had, policy evaluations and things like that. Uh, so this is what the new architecture sort of looked like. We kind of containerized uh, Cloud Custodian and we ran it in and cluster. All the events that were coming in were coming in via event bridge SQS and APIs. We kind of built that out. Uh, Cloud Custodian has uh, features where you can stream the policies basically it would uh, take a list of all the changes that are there and like send it to slack and things like that right um so basically we aggregate instead of lambdas we kind of shifted to containers to be able to kind of reduce our cost not hit our limits and just have a centralization of our resources with that being said uh how this rep, rap, uh, rap, writing this rep, wrapper helped us was basically uh, we could integrate this within our CI CD, right? Uh, so that any checks, we have checks against the specific policies for that particular specific account or that particular specific OU. Uh, and then we could have, hey, these are the change or Terraform or any other IAC that you write. And these are the validations that would fail. So that is something that we did. Uh, the second thing was we kind of centralized it. It become, became very much scalable because we could in, increase or decrease the level of the number of containers based on the uh, queues, uh, the messages within the queues, the number of uh, other matrices around resources and our lens and things like that. Single deployment. Or we didn't have to deploy this in every account in things like that. Uh, so it became one single account. It became really easy to manage because uh, we didn't really have to do a different deployment uh, for GCP within AWS itself be or because earlier you would have every diff a bunch of lambdas in every account in every region, which became really hard to track in uh, a lot of those uh containers right uh th that those centralizing all the policies multi-organization deployment and in just better runtime security in terms of what uh, versions are we using of uh runtime versions and dependencies that we're using right so it, it kind of helped us in me uh, having better track and visibility and control over this uh, while these were the features around the wrappers and things like that, uh, there we kind of had like a lot of policies that we would write. We kind of had about, at the end of it, we kind of had about 1,000 plus policies within our infrastructure uh, that were running, right? Uh, now, there are places where you would have to write a policy for example, like MFA, right? Or user disabling or an MFA, that's one API call. Then if the user is adding 
an MFA, that's another API call, right? So if there are two calls, since cloud Story operates at like an API call level or like one entry within CloudTrail, uh, you kind of have had to check, tag the resource, hey, this is something that I need to check. Then in the next policy, you will have to, hey, if there are resources that are tagged with this particular tag, check for these. Uh, MFA is one of the those classic examples because uh, even for changing an MFA device uh, for your service account or your user, you kind of had to make two API calls, right? Uh, so sec the second one is you could have multiple actions as we sort of saw earlier, when you have like a create bucket that's being, that is happening within your infrastructure, you want to buy a bucket policy, you want to have HTTP as being enforced within your bucket, right? So all your encryption in transit and things like that would happen. Uh, then access logging, right? Uh, all S3 access logs are being sent to appropriate location based on the appropriate categorization of the bucket, right? Having data at rest, right? Having uh, KMS keys being unable uh, for encryption of your files was one thing. Uh, now for this, there is execution modes, right? Since we kind of wrote our wrapper, uh, there were a bunch of execution modes that we kind of relied on. Even bridge was one, right? The, this helped in uh, your schedule jobs and things like that. Cloud trail, we kind of had alerting based on cloud events, guard duty to kind of look at guard duty events and then have uh, remediation for base, a bunch of guard duty alerts that sort of came in. Personal health disk boots, uh, this was something uh, that Ops really find it, found it useful to basically, uh, if there's like a EC2 deprecation notice that has come in, they'll automatically cycle it uh, by writing a policy and even Google uh, Security Center and things like that. So that was a, a bunch of execution modes and things where which from which we would invoke an event and which would get processed uh, within uh, the policies. Uh, policy distribution was another thing, right? Uh, that we kind of wanted to do. Uh, a lot of our policy distribution, as I said earlier, was based out of GitHub. Uh, so we kind of had branching controls in terms of, hey, this would get deployed as a stage and a production so that there are variations within the policies. And we test all the policies before we kind of enroll or promote them to a higher level uh multi-person sign off every commit or every merge request or pr request would have to be uh basically looked at by some other person it didn't have necessarily like a security person looks at security uh, policies and things like that anybody could review uh, from a set of me members and just kind of merge that looks good to me uh sort of having that visibility helped uh conditional policy execution because uh, we dealt with a lot of infrastructure, we always had limits within our policies hit uh, around percentage, like max change percentage. If you see this policy uh, and these conditions and filters being met, execute, but only at 5%. So we, we don't, a bad policy doesn't really affect uh, a lot of our infrastructure. We had cutoffs uh, and things like that. We had basically policy stream uh, to kind of stream all the changes that were happening. It uh, took all the policy policy changes from Git, and then those were streamed into Slack, so that we kind of had a second level of visibility in terms of hey, this these changes are happening in Git, but these are the set of changes that are actually happening uh, within our infrastructure. And validation of policies, right? Before anything kind of goes in or it's distributed to the systems or deployment, we would validate within the pipeline and things like that. While we had a lot of distributions and things like that, we wanted things that we needed to look out for, exception management, because in an organization there always will always be exceptions. You can't avoid it. You can't really get rid of them. You will always have to manage exceptions, right? So making sure you kind of take the right approach for that. 
uh, as we said, you, it, this can because of the post processing nature of custodian, it can uh, sometimes break or interfere with the existing security stack. Hit uh, around there are simultaneous changes being made to a single resource by some other systems. Uh, do not not scoping your policies too wide, right? Uh, what was one thing? Limiting the number of resources, as we kind of mentioned, con conditional policies. Uh, you can have checks within your policies to kind of take a look at it, only limiting those questions. Uh, 